Welcome to video two of the Wednesday, the 5th of January lecture for European history, because I obviously hit the wrong button. Okay, we just saw a little bit of uh, uh, Tevia singing about tradition, and he's not wrong. Most of the things that we have seen that change European society are urban phenomena or a phenomenon that re relate to the aristocracy or the growing urban middle class, the skilled professionals, lawyers, doctors, and so forth. But farmers' lives still revolve around throne, field, and altar. This is about to change. The diurnal rhythms of the farm, diurnal being day and night, are going to be replaced by the tyranny of Captain Clock, where we slice time into ever-decreasing size bits, and every bit of time must be accounted for. After all, time is money. How many times have you heard that? No, time is time. Time is worth a hell of a lot more than money. If you're at the last moment of your life, and you've got money, you'll happily trade it for time. There was actually this one movie, it's called In Time. It's basically about um, how humans were genetically engineered to live until the age of uh, 25, but after, as soon as they hit 25, they have one extra year to live. And how it works is money is actually, the time is money. So um, it was like put in years, minutes, hours and seconds. That's disturbing. Yeah. There's another thing that's similar to that called Logan's Run. It was from the late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. And basically you have a post-apocalyptic society with very limited resources in these domed cities. So everyone's allowed to live a full, luxuriant life and then they're killed at age 30. Mm -hmm. No one lives past 30. So it's, it's it's anyone who tries to run and hide gets hunted down by Sandman. It's uh, yeah, science fiction. I love science fiction. Good science fiction. Not Disney, Star Wars. It's horrible. <laughs> um, so, the way that boys and girls grow up used to be a son follows his father into the fields when he's old enough, and he sees what the men do. And the men use him to do things that a child is useful for, get into small places, do grunt work, whatever. And the boy learns quickly to do what the men tell him to do. Otherwise, the boy learns, you know, what flying is like and what pain is like. Because the, the men will teach the young boy his place. And his place is to do what the hell he's told uh, until he becomes a man himself. Uh, and before that, he was with the girls. And what the girls do is they spend their time with mom around the house and in the kitchen. And they learn all of the skills. And it, it is a highly skilled job to be a housewife, especially in a pre-industrial time. But at any point, up until the 1960s or 70s, where you have machines do all your work, the girls learned from the women. And, you know, they learned how to talk. They learned how to gossip. But they also learned how to cook from scratch every meal. They learned how to clean without a vacuum, uh, without, without any of the uh, accoutrement that makes things. They learned how to do it all. So that by the time they became of age, which happened a bit younger than you are, age was physical adolescence, which is what? Any ages, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there. So you'd have your bar mitzvah if you were a Jewish boy, or a bach mitzvah, well, that's more modern, if you're a Jewish girl, or whatever. You'd come into your own, and you'd then start living your life. It's a simple way of life. It's a slow-paced way of life, but it's a very hard way of life. Those people who look back on the past and see this idealized utopian Eden don't think about it very clearly. I, When I was uh, your age, um, because I played Dungeons & Dragons, I, I also briefly had a flirtation with an organization called the SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronisms. What it was and is, it still exists, is a medieval revival society. Basically a bunch of medieval history and literature geeks 
uh, get together and they dress up and they gather in these places and they, they, they play out a role. And it's sort of basically a role play mixed with a country fair for a few days. Every year they have a war to see who is going to control Western Pennsylvania, which is on the border between the Kingdom of the East and the Kingdom of the West. And the loser gets Western Pennsylvania. Um, but they idealize it. The past before industrialism was not easy. It was slow paced. It had a number of holy days, but every day the cows need to be milked. Every day, certain jobs need to be done. Every day, even on Sabbath. So what devout Christian families do for Sunday and what devout Jewish families do for Friday sunset to Saturday sunset is they have to plan ahead so that they can keep Sabbath without breaking it. They have to have all the stuff that can be done ahead of time, ahead of time, done ahead of time. So everything is going to change. All of this. I think I do have time, so I'm going to show you why. And the why has to do with human innovation. Human innovation along these lines. Shades again, please. There's an old saying. Well, not that old. It's, it's, it's from modern physics. There are three motive forces in the universe. Three motive forces in the universe. Matter, energy, and enlightened self-interest. Enlightened self-interest is what is going to prompt this change. Um, give me a second to follow up the... Proper. Milton Friedman is the father of monetarism, which is a economic theory that's believed in by most conservatives. Um, he did a show back in the. 60s and 70s called The Power of the Market. Lights, please. And here he talks about the power of the enlightened self-interest and what is at the heart of the free market. It's, it's not any theory. It is, it is the pursuit of your own best interests. <laughs> So what that was about was the way the free market works. Like our freedom, it's not theoretical, it's not utopian, it's not some design thing that college academics can wrap their brains around and say, yes, this is perfectly formed. It's not an abstraction. Like our constitutional freedom, the free market is simply people going about their business without interference. Pursuing their own best interests. And in pursuing their own best interests, they end up producing something to make a living. And whether that something is you're working an iron mine, or you turn iron, iron into steel, or whatever part of the production process of that pencil that you're involved in, you don't do it for some theoretical common good. You do it to feed your family. You do it to get ahead in the world. And by doing it, by being able to work and buy and sell without undue interference from theorists, what we have produced in the industrial world is the greatest change in human living standard ever that took a 25-year average lifespan for most people on Earth. That's true. And gave most people in the developed world lifespans into the averaging into the 70s, 80s, moving up towards 90 in some places in the developed world. That's what industry does. That's what the free market, which produces industry, does. Remember that the next time somebody talks to you about the glories of socialism and how unfair capitalism is. It's not socialism that brought us out of the uh, stink piles of the 19th century's early factories. It's the free market. It's not socialism that brought us out of throne, field, and altar. It's the free market.
It's not socialism that advanced our technology to the point where we can have reasonably comfortable air temperatures all year round. It's the free market. When the Soviet Union finally fell, they were still using coal-powered railroad locomotives. Nobody in the West used coal power locomotives. They hadn't for decades because of the free market. Thank you. Have a good day. Hold on.